So the next speaker is an entrepreneur turned investor, a design thinker, design director at IO, but he also set up a rather smart way of involving the smart crowd in creating world-changing projects um, called Open IDEO. Please could you welcome Tom Hume. Thank you, David. So I cycle past this park daily. It's about six miles from here. It's called Highbury Fields. And I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating because there's something through the middle of it, which urban planners might call a desire path. And it's interesting to me because when the park was created, I think everyone, particularly in bad weather, was expected to walk all the way around the perimeter. But they don't. They walk straight through the middle. And it's fascinating because I wonder to myself, do Islington Council look at this and they, do they think, bloody stupid people of Islington, you're so lazy? Or do they think, wow, how can we change the park with that in mind? And I wonder, on the subject of innovation, I wonder if actually this is an interesting unit of analysis for you guys, whether you work in big companies or startups or politics, how do you think about these equivalents? Do you look down on your customers, your citizens, and say they're stupid? Or do you embrace it? Because startups, often scratching their own itches, they enjoy this stuff. They're solving their own problems. They're designing their own desire paths. Now, big companies, when they sort of look at this, and if they think slightly negatively <laughs> about their customers, they lose probably the best source of feedback they can possibly have. And they'll often say, oh, people are weird, people are complicated. It's not true. Human needs remain unchanged. From way before when Maslow wrote the hierarchy of needs in 1943, our needs have basically stayed the same. What's changed is technology and tools have enabled us to meet them in new ways. So I'd love to share with you some thoughts of how you, if you're in a big company or politics or anything else, you guys can start to build that empathy for your customers because I think that's the best way you can ever innovate. Because if you don't innovate for them, it will never get adopted. It's a simple fact. So here's the first one. Live like the customer. So sticking on desire paths, this is actually Brasilia, which in the 50s and 60s, it was designed by Neymar. Amazing, amazing sort of postmodernist city, really interesting. It's interesting to me because, you know, when he looked at the data at the time, he was told categorically, everyone will be driving cars in the future. You will not need to walk anywhere. So he didn't build pavements. There are no pavements in Brasilia. There are some since, but this is amazing because these desire paths you can see on Google Maps, they cross at the top eight lanes of traffic then four lanes of traffic, then four and then eight again. <coughs> Had he lived like the potential inhabitants of Brasilia, he would have seen that not everyone would have cars. He would have realized that actually not everyone would go that long route round on the bus. They couldn't afford to. So one of the things you can do if you're in a company or politics is just live like your customer. Go through the same experiences. So here's an example. What do you guys think this is? Ceiling, yeah. Why, why is this an experience? What's it an experience of? It's a hospital. It's a hospital. So when you're asked what your patient experiences look like, or when you're given analytics on a hospital experience, this is the truth, not an Excel spreadsheet. This was actually done by one of my colleagues, Christian, a few years ago on a project, and I found it amazing because he sort of went through this process, and he was only asked a couple of times why he had a camcorder stuck to his head. <laughs> but the, 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 cool thing, the cool thing with this is these stories, that film, become very emotive. Human stories and experiences are like SEO for our minds. We remember them better. So delivering these experiences that you can act on them, you can empathize. You guys have probably already had ideas of how you can make the ceilings more like this and maybe convey information. But sometimes you can't actually live like the customer. You can't go through the experience yourself. So the next best thing that you guys could do is you can actually just observe them in the real world. Now, by the way, focus groups are not the real world. If I was to ask you guys right now in public about how you live your lives, 
You're either not going to tell me the truth deliberately because it's embarrassing, or alternatively, you'll unknowingly not tell me the truth because you can't imagine it. You go through it in your daily life. So instead of focus groups, there's all sorts of other things we can do. A.G. Laffley and P&G really inspired me to this effect. He sold detergent. I imagine, you know, he probably actually, to his credit, did wash his clothes quite regularly to go through the experience. But the other thing he did when he was going to emerging markets, he would watch how real people wash their clothes. So he'd go down to the river shore, the river banks in India and see how ladies were washing their clothes. And he understood the constraints. We can all do that stuff. And what you see is people's desire paths are incredibly creative. I walked out of my house the other day and saw this lady. That is a desire path for a hands-free kit. <laughs> you run a focus group, and she's going to tell you she doesn't need one. She's not in the market. You observe her in real life, you'll see she's actually adopted her own desire path. Here's another example which scares me, which we did a project. And if you were to ask this lady, old lady, in a focus group, do you take your medication every day? Does it give you any problems? She would have said, no, I take it every day, no issue. You go and see how she lives her life and you see she use, is a salami slicer to actually take the top off the pill bottle. So focus groups don't work. Live like your customer, understand them. And actually you can do this online as well. So David mentioned Open IDEO. So we have the community of 50,000 that collaborate together for social good. And I think one of our jobs as designers of this platform is to look for the emerging desire paths. So one of the things we do is we look at the search box. You can't fully see there, but search queries are like desire paths. Very few people look at the search queries on their site, but it's the clear feedback about what your homepage is not doing. So in our case, if I built a word cloud, it looked like this, and there's a clear message to me. We're doing a bad job of helping people understand or learn from the home page. So that desire path was clear. Or you can go one step further. This is even closer to desire paths. This is a heat map of our site. So this is where people's cursors go over time, which they think correlates to tracking your eyes to about 80% accuracy. And you can see again, there's a lot of wasted real estate on our home page. You can see that people are actually just going to look at challenges and want to know how it works. So if you look at the site again in about four weeks, you will see that we've completely redesigned it on this basis. We've taken this feedback, this desire path has taught us. So the first thing was actually live like the experience, live the experience. Secondly, live like the customer. I wanted to share one more. And that, I think, is another advantage startups have over large companies. Now, we as human beings have this sort of overwhelm. I'm actually glad I've not seen a, a normal distribution today because you usually see them absolutely everywhere. We force everything into a sort of normal distribution. We've seen a few similar ones. Not everything falls within this bell curve. But the interesting thing is the main market, the big companies, the governments are forced to look at the middle, the average Joe, the normal person. But sometimes, in fact, in every case, you can be sure that the normal, the middle of the curve tomorrow, will have moved. The curve moves over time as we develop new skills, new behaviours. And so you can learn perhaps more from the extremes. So here's another example of that which I found inspiring on an IDEO project. So if you'd spoken to this lady in a focus group, she would have said, yep, I have a credit card. We spoke to her because she was terrified of debt. And then when you go and see in her house and you say, oh, show us where your credit card is, expecting her to take out her purse, she opens her freezer and she's actually frozen it in a block of ice. So that over time, it forces a kind of reverse cooling off period, I guess. Sorry, I just flipped that accidentally. It's like a reverse cooling off period. And you can design for that as well. Again, you guys will have had ideas. You could do that digitally, a cooling off period. These extremes are interesting and fascinatingly, they can become the norm tomorrow. So digitally, we see this as well. I'm fascinated at the moment about the rise in kind of ephemeral services. So there's a phenomenon on Facebook. And by the way, we kind of, you know, the, the non-digital natives, I guess that would include me, would look at these services like Facebook and we would expect teenagers to be throwing their data out there and ecstatic about it. They don't care about their data exhaust. What we're learning is the opposite is true. 
actually they're very, very savvy. And you see this behavior emerging. It's called white walling on Facebook. And it's users actually eroding, erasing their whole profile at the end of each day so that they use the functionality of Facebook during the day, but they leave no data trail. Again, it can be a phenomenal learning for us. And actually, if you were Instagram, i.e. Facebook, looking at this, you could have perhaps predicted that Snapchat would do well. And sure enough, Snapchat, there's more than two times as fo many photos uplo uploaded per day versus Instagram. And sometimes they can become quite powerful for your business. So this is an example of that. This is the first tweet ever that, in theory, suggested the use of a hashtag in 2007. So these were extreme users, tech-savvy people at a bar camp in San Francisco, and this person suggested using a hashtag. What I admire about Twitter is they saw this desire path, they realized the functionality was good for their core vision, and they built it into the product. So I'll close out um, just by saying to you, I genuinely believe great design in all of our jobs, whether it be architects, whether it would be designers, politicians, business people, is to do this. It's actually to create delightful desire paths, to make them feel painless. And it doesn't matter if it's online or offline. In fact, that whole sort of categorization is ridiculous. It's just life now. They're blended. So to go back to this one, I, I want to defend Islington Council briefly and explain that this desire path arrived, it appeared after Arsenal Football Club relocated to just the other side of this park. <laughs> so to their credit, they could never have envisaged that. But this one doesn't inspire me. The desire path that's just round the corner in an estate round the corner from this that does inspire me is this one. <laughs> and this one, this one inspires me because I think nine times out of 10, when you guys see this in your business or in politics, your natural instinct would be to put up tape around it and force people around. But someone, I'm hoping after doing a talk like this, someone will own up that it was them and I can hold them in glory. They'd be my hero. Someone has said, no, let's work with it. Let's lay gravel and let's make the best of the desire path because how people use your product or service is the only truth. Thank you very much.